Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk About House. I'm Todd. I'm Juana. Okay, we have great data here. Uh, this data from Black Knight. Of course, this housing market data. Um, there's a piece of data in here because we're going to do a comparison between now and 2008 and that housing crash. I know we've done a lot of these videos, but the reason we're doing this is I got a new piece of data I didn't have that BlackRock came up with. Mm -hmm. It is literally the best data piece of data point I've seen in a year. Mm -hmm on yes. the housing differences between the housing market now and then. Yes. Okay, so uh, before we get started, make sure you subscribe to the channel because when we do these updates, you'll be able to get notified if you're really into housing, if you're kind of a housing geek. We do lots of data. We do lots of data and sometimes we do fun videos about housing and sometimes we even do housing in other countries. Yeah, we did that Croatia video that yes. blew up. It got a ton of, but all the views were in Croatia. Yes. They were Croatians. Okay, right, so here's the headline of the article. The average American homeowner has nearly $200,000 in home equity thanks to rising home prices. Wanna, when the housing crash occurred prior to the run-up, the median home price in the U.S. was like 175000 So there was no way the average person would have had 200000 in home equity because right. everyone pretty much would have had their home, their home screen clear. And even at the run-up, we the median home price in the U.S. went to like three fifteen or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, t let's talk about this number two hundred thousand. Um, this is that's a big number. It is a huge number. Now remember, a lot of this is for two reasons, right? Number one, forty-two percent of residential homes are owned free and clear, so of course that plays into this number. And then the second part is lots of people, um, you know, something between like sixteen million Americans or something like that. Uh, refinance their homes uh, and they've got this phenomenal interest rate so all of that plays into this amount of equity and of course you know through the course of the pandemic we had the huge run-up in um, in prices so all of this equity is because of all of these factors so that that's an important thing to note but when you look back at the Great Recession and what was happening with that that wasn't the case there was a run-up in values but People were not putting 10, 20, 30 percent down. There were not as many homes that were owned free and clear. So the, the equity wasn't there before the way it is now. Okay, we've got some actual data on that. That's pretty good. Um, the other thing to think about too is when you consider this number, and like I said, we're going to go through these all these numbers here. If the average person has 200,000 equity and the median home price right now is like 440, mm -hmm. home prices would have to fall 40 percent just to get take them to zero equity mm -hmm. so a 10 or 20 percent drop you wouldn't be forced to sell or panic sell your house because you still have a ton of equity people don't sell because it's just like any other asset you don't sell it just because it dropped in value if you bought stock in a company if the next day it drops you know two percent you didn't you don't have to sell it you don't go oh my gosh i got to sell it now that it dropped right well if that was the case everybody would sell their car as soon as they bought it because it dropped in value well the other thing is if you <laughs> bought a house in april you'd have to sell it in november because in november home prices go down and then they come up again the next year mm -hmm. it's a cycle so you would always everyone buying in april if you bought 100 percent, you'd always be upside down mm -hmm. the next by the fall okay here's the next here's the first big quote homeowners equity hit 10.5 trillion in June, the fourth highest month on record, up from 10.3 trillion in May, according to Black Knight report released this week. It reached 10.8 trillion at the end of 2022, a bumper year for home prices. Um, that's a lot of money. You know, it's a little more than I have my checking account. Yeah, 10 just, point, just a little bit. But I still have checks. <laughs> so I could just keep, I could put 10.5 trillion on a check. That's a lot of zeros. There you go. Yeah, that's a bunch of zeros. Okay. That's a lot of equity. The this the idea with this number is you it gets it gets you perspective of how many like you said forty two percent of all homes are owned free and clear. So it's a lot of people don't. There's not a lot of have to sell. No, we ninety percent of the people that have a loan. Okay, but even the have to sells. So let, let, let's talk about them for a moment. Okay. Okay. So let, let, let's say okay, you are, uh, you know, your loved one has passed away. And, you, and there's a house, and it has to be sold so that the inheritance can be split up. Okay, that's a have to sell. What does that mean? Well, it means the house gets sold and the inheritance gets split. That doesn't mean that somehow there's something negative that happens regarding that house. Let's say that you have to move across the country and you have to sell your house. That's fine. You have to sell. Great. But it doesn't mean that you're upside down, that you owe more than what the house is worth. So the have to sells are not necessarily 
hurting anybody. They're not necessarily hurting the seller. They're not hurting the market. There's nothing negative about that. They're just simply bringing inventory to the market. So please consider that. Please consider that have to sell does not mean something uh, that, 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 that there's distress involved, that, that somehow this is hurting somebody. We have the low, we have right now in Las Vegas, we have about 2,200 2, houses available for sale in Las Vegas. That is a substantially low. It's mm -hmm. probably, it's a, less than a third of what we had the same time last year. It's less than half what we normally have. We need more people to sell. Like we literally need the end people to sell. Right. So to, just to get back to equilibrium, we're at disequilibrium, which is why home prices have been going up. Okay. So we need people to sell not because of home values, but we need people to sell because the, um, the market right now is such that buyers don't have anything to buy. So this is not about you know creating more transactions for realtors or you know so, something like that. But this is simply about having a healthy market where buyers have choices, um, and that's not happening at the moment. Okay, here's the next piece of data: the Black Knight Home Price Index has also reached a record high. Now remember, this is August of 2023. Yes. Okay. The company's data goes back to 2000. There's no way prior to 2000 home prices were more than they are now, right? They were substantially less. But remember, people were told back in June of last year, oh, wait a year for the home prices to crash year over year. Home prices are up compared to what they were, which was would have been unheard of with the people telling you the market would, housing would crash, your home price would be worth less, 40 to 50% less. You should sell your house and you'll buy, be able to buy two of them next year right, for the same amount of money. Now this does not mean your specific house or your market. This is the index for the entire country. Mm -hmm. Certainly you have markets, some of the West Coast markets that are down. You have some East Coast markets that are up, like especially in the South. Um, rents in New York City have hit a record high. A median rent in New York City is 5,500 a month. A record high. Remember, it tanked in the pandemic. You could you could get rentals all over the city, and now all of a sudden there's no rentals again. And if you want to rent something, it's crazy expensive. Right. Okay. Okay. Home price. And we just did a video last week that was the another. It was a um, uh, another indexed one. Remember, and it was they came to the same conclusion. The indexed year over year prices had been up every year uh, for 15 years straight. Mm -hmm. So we thought. Because the, the the median number was less at like 0.9 percent less, so the the that peak to trough for that top to year over year was 0.9 percent. But when you indexed it and didn't use medium, it was higher. Mm -hmm. And I forget who. Do you remember who that was? I don't. It wasn't Wells Fargo or somebody no, like no. that. It was somebody like that. Oh no, it was Redfin. Or, Red. No, no, it wasn't Redfin. Anyway, I thought it was Zillow. Maybe it was Zillow. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Uh, here's another quote: The average mortgage holder. Now, member, mortgage holder. So 42% of the housing market's free and clear, no mortgage. This is, we're talking about the other 58%. Mm -hmm. The average mortgage holder had 199,000 in equity in June, up from 185,000 the first quarter of the year, Black Knight said. So you have 58% of the people have 200,000 in equity. The rest have 100% in equity. It's all free and clear. Right. That's an unheard of amount of wealth and providing stability to housing. We, this is not a leveraged housing market. Despite people today having a slightly higher interest rate, the rest of the market is pretty much locked down. Right. right. And which is that lockdown is the reason for the, um, for the low inventory. Remember that because those people with those low mortgage rates, they're, they're hanging on to those and they're trying to find ways to buy their next home while keeping that low interest rate on their on their current home and keeping that as an investment property. And that's going to be something that's going to take a long time to work through, okay? Because the only way that's going to get worked through is primarily through new housing stock uh, being built, and that is just being built at a way too slow pace to, to, to deal with that. Uh, some 14 million homeowners refinanced during the pandemic and secured ultra low mortgage rates, the New York Fed said. Homeowners who refinanced over the last three years save $42 billion cumulatively, Black Knight added. Uh, 14 million, that's a substantial percentage mm -hmm. of the housing market. That's yeah. probably a third of the people who, because remember, 42% of the people are free and clear. You only have a, you have a, you know, you have that different number of people who have mortgages. Right. 14 million of those refied mm -hmm. substantially 
low mortgage rates. They're pretty much locked in. Right. They're so good for life. Well, so you've got 14 million who refi plus the ones who purchased at that. So yeah, those are just so, refis. So, so, so that that's a higher number still. So that that kind of gives you an idea. I mean, there were people who didn't refi who, you know, maybe had a pretty decent interest rate to begin with, or they had such low balances that it didn't matter. So, so there are other other things at play there too. Okay, here is the magic number, mm -hmm. the number you've been waiting for. This is the number with the meme with Matt Damon, <laughs> or no, Leonardo DiCaprio holding the beer and the cigarette, pointing at the TV, going, "That's the that's it, mm -hmm. right? That meme." On the flip side, <laughs> only 344,000 homeowners are underwater or, 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 more, than, or oh, more on their homes than their properties are worth. During the height of the Great Recession, more than 16 million homeowners were underwater on their mortgages, Black Knight added. Okay, the number is 46 times more. Mm -hmm. There were 46 times more people underwater. So for every house, when you drive down, if you were to drive down a neighborhood in the U.S., you're going to find like 1% of the people underwater. Mm -hmm. It was 16 times more. Here's the other thing. That's not adjusted for the fact that the country is even bigger. Mm -hmm. So remember, with 16 million homeowners, there were only this many houses. We've been adding houses over the last 15 years. So we have way more houses, probably 30% more houses, but then we have... 46 times less people underwater. Right. Like this number to me, when I saw this number, this blew me away. Right. So look, this is an indication that it's a healthy market. This is an indication that people are doing well. People can afford their homes. This is a good thing. This is also an indication that there's a lot of support for the housing market. Uh, so these are all good news. So uh, regardless of what other people are telling you, you know, look at the numbers. The, the numbers don't have feelings. The numbers don't have an agenda. So these numbers are the ones to look at and say, what makes sense to me? Okay, here's another piece of data. It costs homeowners $2,308 in July to buy a typical home worth $443,000 up from $2,292 in June. Black Knight said the cost includes principal and monthly interest. A household earning median wages would have to spend 36% of their income on their home. Wanna, back in the day, people used to spend right up to the DTI limit. They would literally borrow as much money as they could to buy a house. Mm -hmm. They would finance as much as they could. Mm -hmm. We know that people today are putting about 20% down when they buy a house. This is not unheard of that 36% of your income, because let's, I wanna point something out here. This same home that you're paying $30, $2,300 a month for, your rent is probably that much. Right. You know, the thing to keep in mind is, you know, so we acknowledge that this 36% is not in every market, okay? We do understand that there are markets where this is substantially uh, more and com completely out of most people's reach. San Diego, um, where median price is a million bucks. Right. And median income is like 60000 right. 6, you know, um, there are lots of places in California in particular, but there are other high price markets. That, that, so we do acknowledge that, but we're just kind of looking at this kind of nationally, right? Because when you take the high price markets like the California markets and others, and then you put them up against markets like maybe in the Midwest where it's like maybe 22%, 25%, and, and you kind of um, put all those numbers together, that's how kind of they came up with this 36%. So look, 36% is, is doable for most people. We do understand that when you get to the high, um, the high price markets, it, it becomes uh, completely untenable, but we have to kind of pick something so we're looking at the middle of the road. Yeah, and then the other thing to think of is this. When you look at the pipeline of people buying, you have, it was like 37 million people said they intended to buy a house in the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. Well, we know there's only gonna be about three or four million homes sold. So basically, the to only the top 15% of people actually are gonna be able to buy a house because all these people who say they want to buy a house are gonna actually be able to buy a house because they're just not gonna qualify or it's out well, of out of their reach. So th there are lots of reasons why people want and then people don't, right? So some of it is financial, some of it is inventory, some of it is life changes. You know, there are lots of reasons. So lots of us want things, but the, but those of us that actually get it done, the number tends to be a lot smaller for a, a variety of reasons. Right. And then the other thing too is remember you have all the cash buyers. They're at the top of that pyramid. Mm -hmm. Then you have all the really high income people. Just like I've used this analogy before, I have friends. Uh, he was a intern for me a long time ago at a startup 
and him and his wife are software engineers. They have no kids. They make an obscene amount of money <laughs> and they're buying something in the Bay Area, which, but it's affordable for them because their income is substantially, significantly high and they're buying their first time home. So, you know, a $2 million house is totally affordable even though the payment's really high because their income is super high. Mm -hmm. So you have those people up too. You have the high income people. Then you have the next group of people, which they don't really have really high incomes, but they've been saving mm -hmm. or they have an asset, you know, they, they got some inheritance and they have 250,000 and they're going to put 200,000 of that down on the house mm -hmm. because that substantially lowers their payment. And then they can afford the payment on their income. Right. So this idea that, housing is strictly i make 40,000 a year and i get i take home you know 3,000 a month in pay so i'm going to i can only afford 1400 a month in mortgage i can't buy anything that's the outlier that's not the norm and i think the problem is people are assuming that everyone buying a house is that person and no one can afford to buy a house uh, and that's absolutely not the case well and you know look look around you i mean there are homes um, in a variety of price ranges, right? So that does let you know that there there is something for everybody, but just not necessarily in that particular market. Okay, here's another demographic. Of, this will be my last point, and then you can wrap, sort of wrap it up. Okay. The people in my that I'm seeing buy houses right now mm -hmm. are one of two people. One, we talked about, extremely high income. Mm -hmm. They make a lot of money. They're buying, they're upgrading their home because they're going through that natural process of wanting the ne next home but then they're not selling the other home. They want to keep it used as a rental because it's an asset and it's appreciating, okay? And they recognize that. Uh, the second type of person is the person who already owns a bunch of rentals mm -hmm. and rents have been going up substantially. So they bought five, 10, 20 rentals at one point, very cheaply. They've blown up in value, but the rents have also gone up substantially. Mm -hmm. In some markets, they've doubled over the last decade and they've got so much rental income com coming in that they're accumulating it. And now they're, what they're saying is every six months I can go out and buy another house. So what they're doing is they're just piling on to their rental inventory, their investors, and they're buying, they're just buying more rental houses because right. they don't need to get loans. They, they're like, I don't need to get a loan. I'll just wait till I have enough and I'll just go out and pay cash for the, the house. In a lot of markets, even in Vegas for 300,000, you could still get a rental. Uh, we just did one. It was like, was it 180, 190, 200? It was a really nice con two bedroom hondo mm -hmm. that was a rental property. Right. So they're doable out there. The cash flow may not be great. The ROI, uh, cash on cash return may not be substantial, but you know, it's better than nothing. Right. So, you know, the other thing is there is that cost of capital, right? That right now uh, you can get, you know, three, four, five percent in a money market, depending on where you're investing it. So the fact that um, a home, a home loan is at 7% is not outrageous when you consider that you could put that, that same money and, and it's safe and you don't, that there's no risk involved. So that explains why we are where we are with interest rates. It'll be interesting to see because we know that the interest rate for the money markets is going to go down way before the interest rate for the mortgages does. So it'll be interesting to see once that shift starts to happen. Um, that probably won't happen for a little while still. I think the Fed is going to be very hawkish and is going to keep interest rates high longer than I think a lot of people anticipate. Uh, because they got, you know, I've said this before, they kind of got beat up on the front end where they didn't raise interest rates fast enough. So now they're concerned about lowering interest rates too fast. With next year being an election year, it'll be interesting to see what happens. So give us your take on that. What do you think is going to happen with interest rates next year? Um, we want to hear from you and we want to hear what's happening in your market. Tell us where you're watching from and what's going on. Please remember to like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, share the video, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.